Uh, we are honored to have our grand round speaker today, Dr. Jandradka Chodronska. Uh, her topic today is past, present, and new era of imaging of uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, Dr. Chodronska is an assistant professor in radiology uh, and a board certified diagnostic radiologist and a fellowship trained cardiothoracic radiologist. She currently holds the position of director of cardiothoracic magnetic uh, resonance imaging program at the University of Michigan Health, Health System. Uh, following her medical training and residency in radiology, she took a traditional fellowship in cardiothoracic radiology and also a postdoctoral research fellowship in Center for Molecular Imaging at University of Michigan. She also has obtained a Master of Science degree in clinical research and statistical de uh, design from University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, she was also a uh, GVAF a fellow on a patient and physician-centered radiology in 2014 and currently participates in University of Michigan R01 boot camp program. Um, she's nationally known for her cardiac, for cardiac imaging research, um, nationally and internationally known, and we are really honored to have you uh, for the grand rounds today. Thank you so much for, for joining us and giving this, this lecture. Um, and you can start whenever you are ready. Thank you very much, Bhavya, and thank you, Health for the World, for inviting me to give you a lecture on imaging of uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is really a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And I would say that this, uh, especially during this unprecedented times, um, value of knowledge, um, sharing, and uh, caring it's really important. So that's why I'm really honored to be here and talk about the new, um, the past, present, and the new era of imaging of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. As Bavia said, my name is Jadranka Stoyanovska. I'm assistant professor and director of cardiothoracic MR at the University of Michigan. Even though um, my research uh, focus, it's uh, mostly, I would say, on cardiac Imaging, I do love chest imaging and COPD. It's one of the topics that I have even done some little research on it. So it, it will be really my pleasure to share all of this with you. And especially how to help um, other countries to utilize the imaging modalities to their greater extent to make sure that we provide the best clinical care to our patients. So I have nothing to disclose and what I would do, I have this uh, little bar that I'm going to minimize it because I really want to focus on the lecture so I can see my slides too. So the objectives of this talk is to really start first with the definition, what COPD is or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, then talk about the phenotypes of COPD. And when I, what I mean by phenotypes, it, that means by imaging features that can characterize different types of COPD. So it's mainly a imaging phenotypes. Then we, we're gonna talk about the chest radiography, which it's not only that has been used in the past, but it's still used right now. And it does have some great benefit to patients who have mainly severe um, emphysema. And then we're gonna move on to how we use CT for um, in the presence, meaning that what are the imaging features that we can distract from CT scans to make sure that we relay the correct information so that the patients are going to be managed appropriately. And then we're gonna define what is emphysema, what is cyst, and talk about management. And management, this is something that I really, really like because imaging can really help how we can differently manage patients. And it really depends on what are the information in our reports that we're going to put that will give a right picture or correct image or picture to the referring physician so they're going to treat the or manage patients appropriately. So it will really imaging will be used as a guidance towards uh, patient's management. So COPD, just as a, like a brief um, definition, represents a group of diseases that cause airflow blockage and breeding related problems. As we know, COPD includes two entities. The first one is emphysema, which is irreversible process, and there's nothing that we can do in this regard. And the second entity is chronic bronchitis. And chronic bronchitis is something that we really can help the referring physicians to treat patients more aggressively and therefore uh, prevent the progression of COPD. 
Symptoms are variable. Patients can present with frequent coughing, wheezing, excess mucus or sputum, uh, sputum shortness of breath, and they can also have very, they can have trouble taking a deep breath, which means <clears throat> that this is really important because imaging can really guide patients' management so we can improve, we can imp Im 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 improve um, their, their uh, quality of uh, life. So let's talk first about the prevalence oops, prevalence in, um, of COPD in United States. In 2014, there were 15.7 million people that have been diagnosed with COPD. And more than 50%, so th those are additional people that are undiagnosed. And if you want to know what is that in a percentage-wise, that includes 12.1% of adults not only in the United States, but worldwide. And um, uh, the Global Burden of Disease Study, which includes the entire world, in 2016, the prevalence of COPD was 251 million people. So if we look at this particular graph, which tells us about the death rate of um, US population from COPD, uh, all the way till 2014, we can see that the death rate has dropped slightly. However, if we stratify the population based on sex, we would see that the death rate in men has dropped. However, the death rate in women has actually remained almost the same, so has not really changed over the years. So this is a very nice study that talks about the change in COPD mortality versus other major causes. Currently, COPD is the fourth leading cause of death, not only in the US, but also worldwide. And the CDC, based on the CDC data, if we see it here, is that the um, COPD by 2017 was the third leading cause of death in women. And the graph that I showed really supports this notion. However, it is projected that by 2020, the COPD is going to become the third leading cause of death, mainly because there's increasing death rate between 1970 and 2002 when compared to other diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. However, with the COVID-19 situation, I don't know if it's going to be the third or will still remain to be the fourth leading cause. So GOLD, GOLD represents the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. And the 2006 staging system of COPD uses spirometry and force expiratory volume one or FEV1 to determine the severity of the disease. So GOLD1 clinically, and this being used clinically, it's d defined as mild disease. That means that FEV1 is going to be up to 29 or less than 30. Moderate di disease represents everything when FEV1 is from 30 to 50. Severe or gold three represents when, uh, when FEV1 it's from 50 to 79. And then very severe will be 80 and above. And that will be defined as gold four. So this is how patients are being stratified based on um, FEV1 on their severity of COPD. So treatment goals. What do referring physicians need to know and mainly how we can help them? So the treatment goals are basically stratified in two categories. The first one is to decrease the symptoms and improve patient's quality of life. And that is very important because as we said, these patients are very symptomatic and sometimes they cannot even walk. Even walking can be very, very difficult. So that is one of the reasons why we would do imaging. So then the referring physicians are going to relieve their symptoms, improve exercise tolerance and improve their health status. The second category, as I mentioned, is to decrease the risk. And how can we decrease the, the risk? It's basically to prevent disease progression, to prevent and treat exacerbations and to decrease mortality. And I'm going to break it down basically to discuss 
how imaging can decrease symptoms or improve quality of life and how, and how imaging can actually discuss or rule out patient's outcomes. So let's first begin with chest x-ray. So chest x-ray, it's a imaging modality that is readily used, that it's readily available. It's used all the time. Even now we're still using chest x-rays, but it's not used for primary diagnosis for emphysema. It's really insensitive for patients with mild to moderate emphysema. And we will discuss um, later why that is important in managing these patients. So why do we use chest x-rays? We can definitely uh, diagnose patients with severe emphysema, but it's primarily to look for other conditions such as lung cancers, pneumonia, pneumothoraces, bronchiectasis, and stuff like that. So something else then can add to the patient's diagnosis. So this is a 55-year-old uh, patient who has a COPD. And as you can see from the frontal view and then the lateral view that I have it here, there's a hyperinflation. So there's a hyperlucency that we can see. We can also see paucity of the vessels that are um, not seen at the, at the periphery of the lung parenchyma, flattening of the hemidiaphragm, and the narrowing of the mediastinum. If we go back and then look at the lateral view, there's increase in the AP diameter, or this is also known as barrel chest. And um, there's also bowing of the anterior sternum, right? So then the, the sagittal view of, of the, or the lateral view of the lungs is wider. The other thing that will really help us to diagnose patients that have severe emphysema based on chest x-ray is to looking at the trachea. So if we pay attention and look at the trachea on the frontal view and measure the diameter and also go on the lateral view and measure the diameter of the trachea, we would see, we would definitely say that the diameter of the trachea on the lateral view, it's greater than the diameter of the trachea on the frontal view. And that is also known as saber sheath trachea. So once we see this, we know that this patient has severe centrilabular emphysema or severe emphysema. That is basically what we can say based on chest x-ray. Let's move on and talk about CT. And CT can really phenotypes COPD. And this is crucial. It's crucial how we are going to manage these patients. So we know that um, most of the COPD patients are smokers, so let's see what are those phenotypes that we're going to identify. The first phenotype is emphysema, as we discussed that before, and how we can identify emphysema. Emphysema, it's a low density, low attenuation area in the lungs, as we can see it right here, right? And that is an irreversible process. That's something that we, cannot, we can really not change or reverse. Then we have chronic bronchitis component, as we discussed. But the chronic, uh, chronic bronchitis component, it really is gonna stratify on two different categories. The first one will be the large airway disease or the bronchitis component, so large airway disease, which is defined by the bronchial wall thickening. And as you pay attention, this is a normal lung in the, in the lower uh, lobes. And we can see if we follow the bronchi, we will see that the bronchial walls are being thickened. So that is one way to say that this patient still has a chronic bronchitis component or large airway disease. The second component of the bronchitis, it's the bronchiolitis, right? Or the small airway disease. One way to tell is by looking at the ground glass attenuation areas in the, in the secondary pulmonary labials, or those will be the centrilabular ground glass nodules. So that we know it's a respiratory bronchiolitis, which is secondary to smoking. Another, another way to distinguish, to distinguish bronchiolitis will be by air trapping. And that is really the greatest challenge when it comes to radiology, because not all the time we're able to define what air trapping is. 
So as I said, the spectrum of all these three components will exist in one patient. So that will be the emphysema, as we said, we're gonna define as a low attenuation, then bronchitis, airway wall thickening, and bronchiolitis, which is defined as air trapping. And as I said, that will be the greatest challenge that we may face. So what is emphysema by definition? It's a permanent abnormal enlargement of air spaces distal to the terminal bronchioli. So it's basically the destruction of the walls of the air spaces that is unassociated with obvious fibrosis. So the alveoli will rupture. And what we're going to see, as I have here on the CT image, it's a low, ad low attenuation area. And two features that can distinguish emphysema from cyst. Number one, if we pay attention in this low attenuation area, we would see that there is a central dot in this central low attenuation area. So the central dot basically represents the pulmonary artery that is running next to the uh, bronchi in the secondary pulmonary labial. And then the uh, second feature that can dist distinguish is the lack of wall. So the emphysema does not have wall because that is a old destruction of the alveoli. So here I have a image of emphysema and as we discussed, two features can define. One will be the low attenuation area, the central dot, and no cysts. Three features based on CT imaging. When we compare to cysts, so look at this here. We do have the low attenuation area, but we cannot appreciate the central white dot, which is the pulmonary artery. And also in the cysts, there will be a tiny wall and that wall should measure all the way up to four millimeter. Above four millimeter and above will represent cavity. So here we're dealing with cysts. And why this is important? Because the differential diagnosis, di diagnosis for cystic lung disease, it's completely different than when we encounter patients with emphysema. So let's talk about how we can analyze CTs when we are dealing with patients with COPD. So the first one will be to qualitative assessment. And this is something that all of us can do, no matter whether you're practicing in United States or in Africa or in Europe or in Asia. Basically, everyone can assess and give the proper reporting for patients with COPD. And then quantitative assessment depends on the availability of some of the software. So I can definitely discuss some of the so so uh, softwares that are available and that we are currently using and some of the new softwares that are coming out. And some of those softwares are being used at Michigan, mainly because we have developed some of them. So let's start first with qualitative assessment. So with qualitative assessment, it's really inappropriate if we if you are looking at CT and know that this patient has emphysema, it's just to say emphysematous changes or just to say emphysema. We really need to define and how we can do that. We need to talk about severity of emphysema based on CT. We need to talk about type of emphysema and distribution of emphysema. And I will tell you why this is really important is because it's going to guide the clinical management. So this paper published in 2015 destratify emphysema based on their severity. And I'm not going to really talk about this, the whole, like the whole concept, but mainly what I wanna to talk to you about is the trace entry lobular emphysema and mild emphysema are going to be defined. And I'm going to talk about that when we encounter one case, it's we are going to define as mild um, emphysema. And then we're gonna talk about the moderate emphysema confluent and advanced destructive emphysema are going to be defined as more severe emphysema. And then in terms of um, paraseptal emphysema, it's really about the measurements. The same is true for centrilobular, and I'm going to talk about that as well. But first I wanted to talk about the paraseptal emphysema. The severity is going to be defined and the threshold that is going to be used will be one centimeter. So if a low attenuation area that you're going to see that is paraseptal emphysema measures 
one centimeter or less, then that will be small or mild. And then moderate or uh, severe or large, um, low attenuation area if it measures more than one centimeter. So let's let's take some examples here. So as we, as I said, A and B, the these two will be mild emphysema, and how we can define it. So once you see a low attenuation area that it's in the in the that it's a, a centrilabular. In that case, you need to measure it. So take the measurement tool and then measure how like what is the diameter of that low attenuation area. If the diameter is up to five millimeter, then you're going to talk about or describe it as mild emphysema. And this is based on the New England Journal of Medicine paper that was published in 2001. So it's really an old patient, uh, old, old paper, but it's still currently used on a um, daily practice. So number two, when we talk about uh, moderate emphysema, then the measurement should be uh, more than five millimeter. And here we talk about severe. So what is severe emphysema? If we see a large low attenuation areas and basically very minimal or no intervening normal lungs. In that case, we know now we're dealing with severe emphysema. So let's repeat the first two. Our mild emphysema, the measurement of low attenuation will be up to five millimeter. Moderate will be C and D, which means measurement above five millimeter of the low attenuation area. And if there's no or very minimal intervening normal lung, in that case, we'll talk about severe emphysema. So now let's talk about the types. So we have centrilobular, panlobular, paraseptal, and very rarely we may encounter parasicatricial emphysema. Centrilobular emphysema, that means when we're going to see the low attenuation areas that are in the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule. And in the center of the pulmonary lobule, we have two structures. The first structure is the bronchus, and the second structure is the pulmonary artery. So when the alveolar rupture, that is the reason why we see the pulmonary artery or the central white dot, as I mentioned. And then along the septae, we have two structures. The first is the lymphatics and the second is the pulmonary vein. But now we're going to focus on the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule. So now let's move on to this one. How do I know that this is central lobular emphysema? So if I can see here, pay attention to low attenuation area, no wall, and there's the central white dot, which is the pulmonary artery. So this, by definition, will be centrilabular emphysema. Based on severity, I see very little intervening normal lung, and I can say this is severe centrilabular emphysema. So if I move forward, so let's talk about now panlobular emphysema. Panlobular emphysema, it's associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And as you pay attention, now we have low attenuation areas that are involving the entire secondary pulmonary lobule. So it may be, and this is a case, right, that of a patient with panlobular emphysema, you would see how, how the low attenuation areas are involving basically the entire, the entire secondary pulmonary lobules and the entire lungs. But the other, other uh, thing that is going to help us uh, differentiating this patient that has panlobular emphysema is the distribution. So this is lower lung uh, distributed emphysema and is panlobular. So you can see that the apices are spared where the bases are heavily involved. So move on to how we can distinguish severe centrilobular emphysema versus panacinar or panlobular emphysema. As I said, they may be indistinguishable, so we cannot distinguish just by looking at the low attenuation areas. We need to distinguish them based on distribution. So centrilobular emphysema is associated with smoking. It's going to affect the upper lungs. And if I can move back, I will tell you here. Look at here. The upper lungs are affected, but the bases are relatively spared. Whereas in patients with panlobular emphysema, the apices are spared, but the bases are heavily involved, right? So that will be one way. And then paraseptal emphysema, which some may say that is related to either aging or smoking, is we see these low attenuation areas that are 
aligned along the septae, right? So that is the reason why sometimes we, when we define paraseptal lymphedema, they may mimic that they have a uh, wall, but they don't because um, the low attenuation area, it's adjacent to the septae. So of course, you know, because the secondary pulmonary labials are attached next to each other, the um, septae are going to mimic the wall, but that's not really the wall. And this is how it's going to look a patient with, paracept with a paraseptal emphysema, and it's going to be, in most of the cases, upper lung predominant. And parasecatricial emphysema, I really wanted to put this in because, you know, sometimes, you know, we live in a completely different world and we may encounter like lung scar and fibrosis, like in this patient with silicosis, um, that had a uh, fibrotic mass and the um, emphysema that we're going to see, it's, it's basically perifocal, right? So it does surround the area of the uh, focal scar or a mass. So this is the emphysema, the low attenuation area in the perifocal area. So emphysema distribution, that is the last thing we need to cover upper low predominant, lower low predominant, and diffuse. And this is very important. Diffuse here is very important. And we and I can tell you how we can distinguish between diffuse and then upper and lower lung predominant if we use some of the softwares. So here, as I mentioned even before, this is severe upper lung predominant central labular emphysema because the upper lobes are involved, but the bases are relatively spared. And we can also use coronal view. And then here, of course, we can see that the emphysema is okay. upper lung and the bases are spared. So we can use yeah. multiple ways, multiple ways that to make, to, um, make um, this uh, statement. So now let's move on to quantitative assessment. The first software that we have been using up until I would say recently is the CT density mask. And the second is the parametric response map. And they're really helping us to provide more individualized patient care. So what is CT density mask? So CT density mask basically quantifies the fraction of the emphysema within the entire lung. And that fraction, it's really important because it can tell us whether we're dealing with uh, severe emphysema and what is the lung predominance. And this is how the CT density mask would, would look like. So the software, and I think this software, um, it does available with uh, GE um, scanners and probably most of the scanners will have this uh, package uh, with them. And what does it do? You see these white areas, they correspond to the emphysematous changes and they're going to quantify the fraction of the emphysema within the lung. So then the next step will be to divide the lungs on two parts. So now we can take the emphysema or the fraction of the emphysema within the upper lungs, as I have it here, 46% in this particular patient. And then we're gonna quantify the fraction of emphysema of the lower lung. And in this case was 12.6%. And then we calculate the ratio. The ratio in this particular case is 3.65. So let's see what those numbers mean. And this basically was published in New England Journal of Medicine back in 2001, when they can define the severity score based on the emphysematous um, changes or the fraction of the emphysema within, within the lungs. And also it's very important to know what the distribution score is as I have mentioned to you, or that CT ratio that I mentioned to use. So the upper lung predominant emphysema, it's defined if the CT ratio is greater than 1.4. The lower lung or the lower lung emphysema is being defined if the ratio is less than 0 0.7. Diffuse emphysema, and this is really important, is being defined if the CT ratio is between 0 0.7 and 1.4. And this is really important. Why? Because as I mentioned before, emphysema is irreversible process. The only way to treat this patient is lung volume reduction surgery. Once 20 to 30 percent of each lung is being removed, in this case, the normal lung is going to re-expand and these patients will breathe better. 
So that's why it's important. We're going to improve their quality of life. However, we need to be mindful and identify the subset of patients who are going to benefit from this procedure. And this paper has showed us that only patients with, upper, with severe upper lung predominant centrilabular emphysema are going to benefit from lung volume reduction surgery. If we encounter patients with diffuse centrilabular emphysema, these patients are not going to benefit and their mortality rate during surgery, it's a lot higher. So these patients, it's not, they're not going to benefit from this procedure. And that is very important because we wanna make sure we provide the best care we can give to our patients. And on the other side, we have airway disease, right? Or the chronic bronchitis component. And why this is important to include in your report is because the bronchitis is still a reversible process and the medical therapy or more aggressive medical therapy will really do wonders. And that is very important because these patients, if they're left untreated, they're going to progress to emphysema, which it's really an irreversible process. And we would not like to do this to our patients. So this is just how lung volume reduction surgery is being done. As I discussed before, 20 to 30% of the um, emphysematous lung is being removed and that will allow the normal lung to re-expand so that the patients will breathe better. Now let's talk about prognosis. So this is, this is one of the recent studies where I have mentioned that was published, pu published in radiology where they have used the trace and the mild, but we said the first two are going to be the mild disease, then the moderate will be the three and the fourth, which will be the orange and the purple. And then the red and the green are the ones that are severe, severe disease or severe emphysema. So what they have showed, and this paper uses a large sample size, so thousands, of patients, the follow-up was 7.4 years, so this was the median. And among these patients, they had 517 deaths. So patients who basically had confluent or advanced destructive, which is defined as we said, we're gonna define as a severe emphysema, their death rate was um, five times higher, oops, five times higher than patients who had moderate or mild disease. So that's why it's important to identify this subset early on so they can get treated. So, they are, so their mortality rate is going to decrease. That's number one. Number two, this is also a very good paper. And I would really suggest all of you to perform these measurements and report in your reports because it's really, really crucial and it's very important. So the uh, pulmonary artery to aorta ratio of less than one, of more, actually more than one, it's associated with, C, with severe COPD exacerbations, which includes increased hospitaliz number of hospitalizations and also increased death in these patients. So this is something easy to do. You can uh, scroll down and get to the level of the right pulmonary artery and you would perform, you would measure the diameter of ascending aorta and also the diameter of the main pulmonary artery and get the ratio between the two. And if this ratio I said is lower than one, than one, then these patients are going to do a lot better than patients whose pulmonary artery is a lot larger than the adjacent ascending, pulmon, uh, ascending aorta. So this is something easy and this is something that you guys can really do. Now let's move on and talk about bronchitis. As I mentioned, airway wall thickening defines large airway disease. This is something that you all can pay attention to. So once you identify emphysema in the upper lungs, make sure you scroll down, look at the normal lungs and look at the bronchi. If you see that the wall of the bronchi are thickened, right, in that case, you would report that as a chronic bronchitis or large airway disease. Another thing to look at if this patient does, is a smoker but does not have emphysema, you can look for respiratory bronchiolitis as is, as it evidenced by the um, centrilabular uh, ground glass nodules that we can see here in the upper lung. So here the advice to quit smoking, I know that is very difficult, 
but you know, should really help this patient's um, prognosis and disease status. The second thing that we need to discuss is the um, airway the, or the air trapping, which identifies small airway disease. Most of the times that will be very difficult for us to do. So, but the first thing is like our HRCT protocol includes inspiratory and expiratory series. And the first thing to do is to look at the trachea on expiratory series and the posterior wall of the trachea to see whether it's flattened or it's bowing inwards. And the reason why I'm saying that is because you wanna make sure that the expiratory series of this patient uh, CT is really diagnostic. So in that case, we can really comment on the air trapping. And the air trapping will be defined as a low attenuation areas, as you can see them here on the, on the other um, image that I have on my um, left-hand side. So up to six areas of low attenuation um, are normal, but if we see more than that, in that case, we can define that that patient has an air trapping. However, um, at Michigan, we came up with a new way, new tool to quantify air trapping, and that is called parametric response map. And I do say that this is in future because, you know, this will be available in the future, probably everywhere else. So what, what did we use? We used the COPD gene study, 194 patients, and they had varying gold status. So the gold was the clinical the clinical um, way of defining the severity of COPD. And the PRM was correlated to prognostic indices. So what did we use here? We used the inspiratory series and the expiratory series, both done as helical scanning. Then we did some image post-processing so that we can uh, use some thresholds. And the threshold for emphysema was minus 950 for small airway disease, uh, minus 750. So uh, if the patient has emphysema, then we can label as a red color. If the patient has small airway disease or air trapping, then will be yellow color and the green color represents the normal lung. So let me show you some, um, some cases. So here, very clear cut, subject A and subject B clinically uh, subject A is normal, subject D has very severe emphysema defined by gold four, right? And if, as, as we can see here, PRM and the results from PRM, right? This is definitely clear cut normal case, PRM it's normal, 85%. The percentage of the emphysema in the second case, it's 28 and also has a functional or small airway disease. So this, you know, imaging here does not really help much. However, in subject B and C that I'm going to show you, clinically they're, they're classified as gold two, or that will be um, a moderate disease. However, let's now pay attention to, uh, if so FEV1, basically very, very similar, but let's pay attention to what the PRM is showing us, right? So emphysema, it's higher in subject C, Right, and you can see here there is a red color a lot more than it's on subject B, but the subject B actually has a more small airway disease. So here PRM really will resolve the conundrum for these two patients, even though they have similar FEV1, so force expiratory volume one, but they have varying percentage of emphysema. And this is crucial because they cannot be treated the same. Like subject B really needs to be treated more aggressively so we can prevent the areas of small airway disease to progress to emphysema, right? This is how we use PRM in daily practice. And um, uh, we get the ratios of what it's normal lung, what it's the uh, small airway disease and what is the percentage of emphysema. Um, I want to really show you this case, these two cases. So the first case or the case A will show you increase in airway obstruction, right? And um, uh, from baseline to follow up. And the case B will show you the decrease in airway obstruction, like how patients, when they're treated appropriately, they will get better. So here the PRM, the baseline was 28% of the small airway disease. Then the follow-up, which was done several years later, 
was at 42%. So we basically missed to treat more aggressively the small airway disease component in this patient. And then he, his, um, his uh, airway disease or small airway di disease progressed over the time. Whereas in the second patient that he was treated more aggressively, you can see that the baseline uh, functional or small airway disease was 32% or the air trapping. And then on the follow-up, the airway trapping decreased to 16%. Um, another case that I really wanted to show you is that how PRM can capture COPD progression is basically emphysema, which means that the small airway disease is going to progress to emphysema, which is irreversible process. So now let's look at the FEV1. So we have a patient that we have scanned at baseline, then at eight months, 19 months, and 26 months. And the FEV1 was also measured at all those four time points. So we can see that the, this blue line is telling us that FEV1 will drop, and then we'd basically stay at the same level where it will drop at eight months. So at 26 months and eight months, it's at the same number. Then we can take a look at the normal lung. The normal lung basically mimics the curve of the FEV1. So it, will, it was a little bit increased and then it will stay and then it will drop. And then now we have emphysema, which is the red line. The red line, we would see how the emphysema progresses over time. And so it does progress from baseline, slightly progresses um, at uh, eight months and then progresses even more at month 26. But if we see it progresses on expense of the small airway disease. So look at this, the small airway disease will decrease, the emphysema will increase. And then at month 26, the small airway disease will decrease exactly in the expense of emphysema. So um, now we can see how the late stage of COPD is very dynamic and uh, small airway disease progresses to emphysema, which I mentioned, and I will always mention, it's irreversible process and there's nothing to do. So I did wanted to put this question out there for you and maybe we can use the chat and then after that I can look at the, what, the, what the responses are, but I wanted to ask you, what is the diagnosis of this patient that I have put over here? It's emphysematous lungs, severe upper lobe emphysema, severe upper lung predominant centrilabular emphysema and bronchitis, upper lung emphysema and air trapping. So this, it will really guide me whether, whether I have explained everything um, in a way that you guys will understand and you will understand the importance of making note in your reports of all these findings in patients with COPD. So take home message, it's, we discuss severity and distribution and type of emphysema and why this is important, right? So the severity distribution and type of emphysema is going to identify patients who are candidates for lung volume reduction surgery, so they will benefit from the procedure. And we will improve their quality of life, which means uh, their symptoms are going to decrease. Then we discuss the presence of bronchitis and why that is important because they can tell us about the second entity of COPD, which is the chronic bronchitis, and why these patients have to be treated more aggressively so that the presence of bronchitis is not going to progress to emphysema, which is the irreversible process, and we have very limited options to treat these patients. And then we also discussed about CT, quantitative imaging, why this is important. It's basically to assess the disease severity that will guide clinical management. And PRM is something that will provide personalized therapy for to identify functional small airway disease and why this is very, very important. So I really wanna thank um, people who, or faculty at UFM who have let me be involved in this um, work. So Ella Cazzaroni, Craig Alban, Craig Alban and Brian Ross are the ones who invented parametric response map. And with that, I really want to thank you all. And uh, I would really close with this uh, quote from Simon um, Sinek, working hard for something we don't care about, it's called stress. And working hard for something we love, it's called passion. 
and I really love what I do. And um, I really love to teach everyone of what are the important findings of imaging that will guide patients' management. And with that, I want to thank you all, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you.